Hi everyone, it's Jerry. This is a round three game from the 2016 Tata Steel Chess Tournament between Wei Yi, playing on the white end, and Magnus Carlsen. This is a pairing that I've been looking forward to for about a year now, since last year's Tata Steel Tournament, where at the time Wei Yi was playing in the challenger section. He went on to win that, which earned him the right to play in this year's master section. So this game here acts as the first meeting between these two. Uh, Wei Yi, 16-year-old from China, clearly one of the most talented rising stars in our game. He is paired against our current world chess champion, the 25-year-old Magnus Carlsen from Norway. Let's see what would happen in this first of many encounters. E4, E5. Knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5, entering the Roy Lopez or Spanish game. a6, bishop a4. This opening has a tendency to be a bit on the positional side or strategic side, where play is non-confrontational, uh, not a lot of pawn tension, the position does not open up, there aren't early pawn exchanges. Mm, rather... Both sides develop slowly. Not the case here such that the position does become sharp. It does does have tension in it. It does open up as early as move 8. Knight f6, castles. Bishop e7, rook e1. b5, bishop b3. Black castles. And after c3, d5. So, okay. Here we are. This is a sharp line in this opening namely the martial attack. This is a gambit line. Black is, with this move, offering up a pawn. Black, with this move, is opening up the position, creating pawn tension. And with this line, black tries to show that this backward, or delay, in the white development is an issue. E takes D, knight takes. Knight takes E. White's now up a pawn. Knight takes knight, rook takes. Black secures the knight's post. d3. We're a dozen moves in. Well within opening theory. Neither player caught off guard. Well within both players' preparation. Both players up until this point have actually gained time on their clocks. They started out with... 100 minutes each. With the time controls in this tournament, you gain 30 seconds per move. So observing the clock times on the side for going from one move to the next does give us some insight as to how much time is spent on each move. Now with this last move in the game, d3, this is the first question I had for myself. Um, I have seen the move d3. I have also seen the move d4. And until I spent the time investigating it further, uh, you know, I didn't have a reason or I, I couldn't identify or share with you a difference between the two until now. Uh, the move D4, I must say, to me at least, and I, probably for many, D4 seems much more natural. Why not go two instead of one? Why not have a pawn watch over a pawn instead of devoting a piece to def to its defense? So. What's a difference between having the pawn on d3 uh, and d4? Well, let me show you one difference. There's some tactical idea uh, involved. If the pawn is on d4, it's quite common, and this is played just in all variations, just in this system, in this opening, the bishop does reposition and get on this diagonal with tempo, challenging the rook. If the pawn is on d4, we do have bishop d6, and the queen can come out to h4. After g3 to defend against h2, she goes deeper into the white position. This is a very strong post for the black queen, and one that white may try to disrupt. For example, with rook to e4, trying to play rook h4 to challenge that queen's post. However, this can be prevented with the move g5. 
super committal move, very weakening move, but it does a good job in preventing rook h4, and it is poison. Cannot be captured, should not be captured. Bishop takes g5 can be met with queen f5, striking it not just one, but two unprotected pieces. Knight d2, queen takes bishop. This is not available if this g5 move is not available if the pawn is on d3. Bishop d6, queen h4, queen h3, rook e4, g5 to stop this idea is no good. Bishop takes pawn can be played because queen f5 strikes at only one, not two, unprotected pieces. Anyhow, just wanted to share one of the differences between these two. Okay. So, in the game it was d3, bishop d6, rook e1, bishop f5, striking at d3. Queen f3, strikes at the bishop, this is ignored. Black sets their sights on h2. If white is grabbing the bishop, uh, this is a very strong attack that black has. Not a good idea for white to grab the material. Development is key, and there's little of it on the queen side. G3 simply parries the threat. Queen H3. Bishop E3 offers the pawn back and it is taken. Um, if white is doing something other than bishop to E3, you know, as it stands right now, black has that direct, this uh, direct connection between the rooks, the thing that we look to do when we play. Uh, to have all the pieces cleared out between our rooks. White is two moves away from having similar. If knight d2 is played, white is still two moves away from finishing development. Uh, the knight still has to move, and the bishop still has to move. So white is offering up the pawn in order to complete development. Bishop e3 with then knight to d2 is the idea that white has. Black gets that material back, white finishes development, and now black plays queen to f5. I should mention that on bishop to e3, it isn't a good idea for black to say, you know what, I'm going to take this opportunity to grab the bishop pair. Knight takes bishop. Because white can recapture, move forward, improve the rook position, prepare to double, and uh, have security over the d3 pawn. That pawn will live. White will maintain that pawn plus. Not a good idea to take the bishop in this position as soon as it plays to e3. Nor is it a good position, uh, a good idea to take the bishop after knight to d2. Knight takes here is also not a good idea because after rook takes, the bishop is hit and white can next take on c6 with the queen. Bishop g6, queen takes c6. The development on the white side is fine, and white has still that pawn plus. Some care, of course, needs to be taken over these weaknesses near the king side, but not a good idea to be taking uh, knight takes bishop there. Only after queen f5 is this now some threat, knight takes bishop. Black is preparing to exchange queens which would rule out that earlier mentioned queen takes c6 move, and only then take the bishop. So black threatens to exchange queens and then take the bishop with this last move. So white gets out of the way, only at this point. Bishop d4. There is no knight takes bishop. The rook is now unmasked. Rook a to e8. King to g2, improving the king position slightly. Queen takes queen, king takes. You could take with the knight, but it may be a little bit uncomfortable. You know, this is the thing that I think about when, uh, if the knight is recapturing, I see a move like bishop to e4, and I see that I'm in a pin, and I can't resolve that pin so easily. You could resolve it in time with something like rook a1, and then bishop to c2, but, you know, just to recognize... Uh, some of the uncomfortableness, <laughs> if that's even a word, uh, some 
you know, or the discomfort, let's say, that white can experience if they're taking on uh, F3 with the knight instead of the king. So in the game, it was king takes queen, rook to e6, and if we observe the clock times, uh, Carlson has spent very little time. In fact, you know, this last move, it seems like it was played pretty, you know, pretty quick. And probably within his preparation still here. And I'm highlighting this because uh, it may have influenced this next move by White. Uh, it seems, it, it may seem appealing to just grab this rook. It does allow this discovered check, but you move the king out of the way and there's maybe, you know, is, is this a liability? You know, something that can be exploited having now this isolated pawn? Well, things can get quite sharp from here. So if white was not uh, uh, prepared, if, if they have not uh, seen this position before, if they have not uh, looked at it before with the computer, it's, it makes some sense to not go in this direction uh, into this sharp line where black is throwing some punches and, you know, if you're not careful, you know, things can quite easily go bad. Uh, my point here is Carlson seems to be, with this last move, the more prepared side. So entering a sharp line, maybe not a good idea. And this is a sharp line. Uh, so we don't have this capture on e6, but instead rook a to c1, which is prepping this c4 move. Uh, the c4 move can be played right away. This is an important question you might have. I'm pointing out, well, rook a to c1 is preparing this. Well, why not just break with c4 right away? You have enough support for it. If we look at c4 right away, uh, this is a move. Um, the idea with this can be to, you know, try and disrupt the knight position. If pawn takes... This would be this would be good for white because the bishop can recapture and what what is the end result of the b pawn being exchanged for the c pawn? Well, black now has some deficient queenside structure, two isolated pawns. Uh, black, however, can actually move the knight and have this move in mind. For example, after c takes b, the rook is hit, but Black doesn't have to react to that. They could play a takes b and allow the rook to be captured because after the recapture, there's a check. If king g2, knight c2 wins the material back. This would not be the case if the rook was on c1. It gets a little bit more involved from this position after king to e3. There's moves like c5 and black playing a line where they're an exchange down, but they have very active pieces. I don't want to show that. Uh, I don't want to go too far astray from the actual game, but that's those are some of the points. Uh, this knight b4 reaction uh, in reply to c4 right now, instead of uh, after having uh, the rook on c1. Okay. In the game, we did have rook a to c1, not the c4 strike. Black now plays a6, or excuse me, h6. This is a uh, flight square for the black king. I should also mention this rook a to c1 move does not allow this quite natural doubling on the e-file. This is, you know, if we have a look at this move, the move played was this, h6, but if black is doing something supernatural like... Uh, Rook f to e8, doubling rooks. What can follow is the exchange of rooks, and then this c4 move, and this is very good for white. Not a winning advantage, but there is some... A white is definitely the preferred side here with this variation. The knight is hit. If the knight moves right away, now this is no good. c takes b. There aren't those tricks of, of bishop takes rook, and then the pawn recapturing with check in this case. 
this is an issue for black. So you actually do have to take on c4 right away. You can't make a knight move. And after bishop takes, bishop takes, knight takes, it can only be white who is fighting for, uh, you know, white is the preferred side here. For what reasons? Well, structural standpoint, queenside, these are deficient. Two isolated queenside pawns. Uh, if you want to take it one step further, compare king positions. This is a better king position. This is an end game. The kings want to be closer towards the center, and this is a, a better positioned white king. Okay, so the natural rook f to e8, not a good idea. Instead, h h6, still having this idea in mind where if the rook is captured in some way, there is this recapture with the discovered check. White gets out of that altogether, tucks the king away, king g2. Rook g6 gets out of the line of fire of the bishop for one and places the pawn in a pin, which is now permitting a knight f4 check. This is something that white allows. Knight e4 is played. About 18 minutes was spent on this move, knight to e4. Uh, a continuation that was likely thought about in this position was the bishop for a knight exchange. This is a big deal in the game. Just, yeah, in, in a chess game, the bishop for a knight exchange is a big deal. Big imbalance to try and assess. Uh, white could have gone for this to give up the light square bishop for the knight on d5 and then look to next quickly eliminate this trump that black has, which is to say the bishop pair by playing bishop to e5. If the bishop's running away, you could look to try and hunt him down in this way. If he's avoiding the exchanges, these pieces can take up some nice posts. Uh, this is a direction that the game could have gone. The bishop for knight exchange, I imagine that was at least one of the things, one of the variations that was considered here to take the knight and then find a good post for this knight. He would have a, a good square to rely upon in that of the d4 uh, square. He did not go for this. Instead, improves the knight position and strikes at the d6 bishop. Allows knight to f4, and this does hit. Knight f4 check, king moves forward. Bishop takes knight, rook takes. Knight d3, striking at both rook and pawn. You move the rook and defend the pawn, right? You could do that. But white instead stays very active with the rook, centralizes the rook. Rook to d1 allows the pawn to be captured. Rook d2, so this is a good post for the rook. It's an active post. Striking at the knight, he's on an open file. White is now down a pawn. Has, however, the bishop pair. Well-centralized rooks in a better king position in this ending. Bishop a3 to defend. Bishop to b6, clearing the rook to maybe enter here along, uh, well, rook to d7 is an idea, but also it's clearing the way for the rook to observe these two jumping points by the knight. Rook to d6, rook takes rook, bishop takes, Rook to e2, knight to d3. If the knight is immediately going here, we can expect a quick capture, and then the rook getting very active. Rook to d2, bishop to e5, rook to e2, bishop to d6. This may also even be an idea going straight in for rook to e4, instead of questioning the bishop's position like this of rook to d2 to e2. Simply rook to e2, hunting down this pawn like this. Rook e4, rook e4 to c4. So, knight c4 was not played. Knight d3 instead. Rook d2. Knight to e5, hitting with a check. King goes back to g2. Bishop e7, that bishop was hit by the rook. Now f4. Yeah. Knight does not have very many options. He goes into c4. Going to, let's say, g4. Yeah, this lets the rook enter, strike at the bishop. White 
will likely grab one of uh, will likely regain the material and still have these two bishops in an open position not a good idea uh, not a good idea for the knight to play to g4 or even g6 for that matter he's just as good on g6 as he is off the board so knight c4 bishop takes knight pawn takes there's been a lot of back and a little back and forth here with uh, one side being up material then giving it back I mean how, how did it play out so far black played the gambit line white was up a pawn white gave the pawn back black was up a pawn and then black is basically giving the pawn uh, back here uh, in each case there's this you know when you're up the pawn your pieces aren't as well positioned you're kind of on your heels and then in order to get off of your heels you give that material back to release the pressure and that that continued to shift back and forth like that from uh, white side to black side black side to white side we had that little uh, shift going on in many cases in this game so far as it stands right now black is up a pawn it's not a super healthy pawn of course but it is a pawn uh, situation of double isolated pawns here uh, but white has rook activity do a rook comparison here white is also on move playing rook to d7 bishop f6 rook c7 bishop takes c rook takes c black is still up a pawn but White has uh, rook activity, better pieces. Rook to b8, a4, bishop to b2, bishop to a5. Number one priority, get rid of this passed pawn. c3, bishop takes, bishop takes, rook takes, rook to b4. And now how to react to this pressure against the pawn? Well, it's a5. That is the best move. Rook to a3. Uh, on rook to a3, black can play a5 and be one step further, one step closer to queening should this pawn fall. So first it's best to play a5 and only then rook to a3. If this pawn is captured, at least this guy has to work a little bit harder to get his to get to his desired uh, a1 square. So, a5, in other words, when the pawn is hit, a5, only at this point, rook to a3, rook check, the king moves forward. You could play back here, but it's a little bit scary to have your king cut off from the action. White is instead moving forward f5 rook c3 looks to transfer the rook looks to also win the a6 pawn so black needs to get back to a position where they put pressure on the pawn does that after rook c3 rook b5 this is the best way to put pressure on this pawn if you're doing it by way of a2 the rook plays to c5 and this is a much more active post for the rook to defend the pawn when you compare that with the rook playing to a3 this is far more defensive this is uh, a better post defense and he also has some aggressive intentions from c5 so after this rook to c3 move it is rook to excuse me rook to c3 rook b5 is played next rook to a3 g5 f takes h takes king to g2 king g7 h4 g4 and now white says i'm not just going to stay here and defend my pawn i'm going to allow you to take it and while you grab that material i'm going to improve my rook position rook c3 rook takes a rook c6 cuts the king off rook check king g1 a5 white gets 
right behind the pawn. A4, king h1, black is up a pawn. Game started out early where white was up a pawn, but we had that a lot of back and forth. There's the shifting of material, the shifting of uh, piece activity. King h1, king f7. There's not a good way forward for either side here. White stays around here with the king, and the rook stays on a6, ideally placed to be behind. Uh, he's ideally placed because he is behind the pass pawn, and he is cutting off the king from moving forward. King h1, a3, king g1, and it is at this point that the players agree to a draw. There's not a good way forward here. If black is trying to improve the king position towards the center, he will have to first go in this direction, but this is not such a good idea. If black is trying something like this, we could play king h1, and as soon as the king plays here, uh, actually, yeah, after the king plays here, we could push h5, and the king will not be able to stop the pawn, so guess who's going to have to do that? The rook. And when he does, this pawn is taken. Uh, even if we have this exchange of the H pawn for the A pawn, this will not be enough to win. Uh, this is an easily holdable uh, draw for white. It's one pawn versus two. So there's really just no way forward here. Uh, black could give a check after A2. Like uh, after king to g1, if black is giving a check, king g2, and then playing a2, white can do basically whatever. Just keep the king sitting here and keep the rook trained on this pawn like this. If the king ever gets down to this point where he is defending the pawn, you could just give a check and then get right back over here to keep pressure against the a2 pawn. But there's even more serious issues that black hat would have to tend to in in such cases, there this is a connected pass pawn, so uh, there's really no way forward. And again, after this king to g1 move, move 60, the players agreed to a draw. So, uh, interesting first encounter between these two. Um, what are your thoughts on the future of maybe these two players uh, battling? Um, I was looking forward to this game. I know it ended as a draw, not uh, the result that most players would really like to see. You usually like to see a win or a loss, some, some uh, decisive result. But uh, yeah, interesting game uh, between uh, Wei Yi, very young talent, and our current world chess champion, Magnus Carlsen. So uh, feel free to leave any feedback, as usual, uh, to this video. Uh, and as usual, I hope you got something out of it. That's all for now. Take care.